I'm, I'm fascinated by the performance of Toyota, Toyota cars. I haven't read many of the books. There are a lot of books I see in the bookstores now about the Toyota way, volume one, two, three, four, five, whatever it is, right? So people wonder how Toyota did what they are doing. They have been, they have been uh, meeting a few problems lately. I think they're still the largest car manufacturer in the world. When Deming wrote his book, he spoke to many, many people in industry, and one person actually made a comment that says, an unsatisfied customer will not talk to you. They'll just go. They'll just go somewhere else. They will not come to you and complain. Even um, a mildly satisfied customer may change. He may look for something better. It's not too bad what you do, but maybe I can get better somewhere else. They will not come to you. Right? So don't think that when people are unsatisfied with your service, they'll come to you and explain calmly to you, but I'm not happy because that's, that's, that's very exceptional. Even if you do feedback, even if you do surveys, it's very exceptional to get a comment, people not happy, and perhaps even with a suggestion how you could do better. We also know that the people who may come up with the best suggestions of how to do your work better are the people who do the work. In Japan, the executives, the chairman listens to the workers, theoretically. Somebody said yesterday perhaps it's not always that, that easy and that's the case, but theoretically. You should do that. The people who do the work know the work better than you. Listen to them. Right. Right. Two words on strategy evaluation. Strategy evaluation has to do with <coughs> controlling, comparing performance with planned outcomes and say, look, did we meet it? Did we not meet it? If we didn't, why didn't we? And this is, of course, where you're adjusting your strategy with facts and figures or whatever with events. So that is part of your emerging strategy. The concept of measuring project success um, has been the subject of research for a long time. One of the leading researchers in the world whom we, we greatly admire and we're in touch with him is Terry Cook Davis. Right? I met him on occasion in South Africa when he was visiting his family. Um, how do you measure project success? Well, at the end of a project you can say, well, did the project deliver what you were supposed to deliver? That's fine, yes or no, that's easy. You can do that fairly straightforward, fairly easy, this is time, time elapsed, fairly easy, at a fairly low level of hierarchy. But then, did you manage the project right is one thing, did you do the right project? Well, that takes a little bit of time to, to realize, to assess whether you did or not. Right? You may do an excellent project, but the project may not yield the expected outcomes. And then, are we doing consistently successful projects? Are we consistently doing the right projects? It takes more time to assess. Now, recently, I'm actually uh, proud to say that Sukat has also included the PRINCE2 methodology in the uh, portfolio of offerings because there seems to be a growing demand for that. In PRINCE2, they make a clear distinction between the project outcome, sorry, the project output firstly, the project outcome, and the project benefit. Simple example, let's say in the airline industry, you, uh, you identify that your check-in procedure for passengers is too slow. You establish that on average a check-in counter can process 12, uh, 12 passengers an hour. Uh, you want to increase that. So you change, for instance, the software that allows, that allows the check-in person immediately to go on to cabin occupation or whatever, have the authority to change the seats from there and whatever the case, whatever that may be. So the project output is a new software. The outcome is instead of 12 passengers per hour, we now do 20. But the benefits may be improved customer satisfaction, therefore perhaps more customers using our airline, and so on and so on. Also perhaps less delay in flight departure because we now check in quicker and so on. Those are the outcomes, the benefits. That's a different level of assessment. The, the person on the ground who checks in does not know that. Right? You need to check that at a different level and probably after a certain time has elapsed. Yeah? Sukkot <coughs> has added another dimension to the assessment of project success. And we think that's valuable. You may or may not recognize this picture, but I'm standing right in front of it. This is our Sukkot Camp 2. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, is that right? Am I saying that right? The camp model, right? 
customizable and adaptable model or method for managing projects. Now we have identified with that a way of assessing project success. Did you create a product as to the plan? Well, you can assess it against the project detail plan. Did you do it? Yes or no? And you will know on acceptance by the customer. This is exactly what the customer wanted. This is what we had in the brief and the design. We've delivered it, Halas. First level of success. Is it all a success? No. An important one, which many people forget, is did we manage the project as per our project management plan, as per our project strategy? We can do that after the customer has accepted, and we as a team now do a project closeout. We do reviews, we do closeout. Did we manage it right as we said we were going to manage it? How is our project management strategy? There are two different things. Because you may create an excellent product that's accepted by the customer, but you may leave a wake of dead bodies in your trail. Not literally, but people with ulcers and people have resigned and people with all sorts of problems. Why? Because the project was so stressful to do just to make, uh, to make all the objectives. Or vice versa. Right? You may run a project extremely well, but you've, you've delivered the wrong product. That's also possible. Right? So that's two. A third dimension starts to look at benefits, right? We had an authorization document with strategic objectives for the project. Why are we doing the project? Have we met those? We may have delivered the right product, we may have managed it well, but was this actually what we wanted? So there is a difference in that. And a fourth level of assessment is have we, by doing the project, helped implementation of our business or indeed our corporate strategy? Yeah. And we don't always think about project success in those levels. It's very easy for the project manager and the team to say when the project's finished, yay, success! And everybody else is looked like, <laughs> look at this, what can we do with this? Right, so many, many different other aspects of success need to be identified by project manager, by program managers, by PMOs, and need to be met for the, the larger benefit of the organization. In other words, meeting following your strategy. And that is an important part of strategy assessment, which, as I repeat, many companies are not yet there. The last bit is about learning. Now, learning can take on many forms. Organizational learning has, in the last 20 years, received a lot of attention largely by the publication of a book by a person called Peter Senge. The book is called The Fifth Discipline, Systems Thinking, as the fifth component of complete organizational learning. Very worthwhile reading, also pretty difficult reading. Um, but uh, something that I think any senior, senior person in organization should be aware of. Now, <clears throat> we've been talking about projects and programs for a long time. Now, what is the essential difference and how does learning actually come into play there? In order to answer that question, we've gone through one of our uh, global partners, Michel Thierry, who published a book in 2010 about program management. However, if you Google his name, you'll see that he published white papers already 10 years before that. He has been thinking about this book and forming his ideas and crystallizing for a long, long time. There are two different ways of thinking about program management. Some people just say a program is a large project. You can use project management tools. It's the same, it's just bigger, more complex, more stakeholders, more communication. Other people say no. There is a fundamental difference between a project and a program. Michel Thierry is the uh, proponent of that approach, that idea. He says, and I'm sorry because the red actually obstructs the lights a bit, we have, uh, anyway, not complaining about it. Um, in project management, right, projects, you tend to have very low ambiguity, right? So there is fair, fair consensus about what it is that the project needs to achieve. There may be higher uncertainty, such as in software development, right, or there may be less certainty. If it's, if it's very, very less uh, sorry, if the level of certainty is high, you could just use a management-based method. This is what you must do, this is what you must do. Everything is fairly well defined. That's the easiest part. All right. If it's less certain, you may use performance-based methods. You're going to have to try a few things 
and you may manage by performance rather than by uh, by delegation of specific packages and so on. But whatever the case in projects, he says the ambiguity is fairly low. There is a fair consensus. There is a fair drive towards meeting that project's objectives. However, in project in program management, right, there is more ambiguity. That means that not all the stakeholders are perhaps in line as to what needs to be done by this program. You may have programs with containing projects that have actually opposing objectives. That is a possibility in a program. So how do you deal with that? You need to compromise, you need to find solutions, you need to synthesize on an ongoing basis. Now, so theory says if that's the case, but your certainty is fairly high, you can, you can work on a power-based method. You need to force decisions through. The uncertainty is not that high. You know fairly well what needs to come out. If other people don't agree, you're still ambiguous about goals, you can force. But if both are low, the certainty is low, or the uncertainty is high, and the ambiguity is high, you can only aspire for some form of success if you apply a learning-based method. Right, so <clears throat> what we need to remember here, projects can be run and assessed on a performance paradigm. How well did we perform? Programs can't, according to him. Other people say yes. According to him, programs need to be managed with predominantly a learning paradigm. Programs change all the time. Right? The objectives change all the time, during the program even. Right? A lot of emergent strategy coming in. What do we do next? Is this still okay? Now maybe we should try this. Maybe we should, maybe we should go back even. Maybe there's something this. Maybe the program is no longer necessary. That's also possible. Now how we see, how we see this implemented <coughs> is actually a fairly substantial bit of theory. So I've left it out. So just be aware that this paradigm is, exist, is in existence and is getting stronger uh, with a view of program management. Now, I don't know if anybody here has actually attended a program management course. Um, sorry, this is not, not trying to market. Uh, but you will have then understood, you will have seen how he proposes this is implemented. This is just an overview of it. So instead of, like what many companies do, plan, implement, control. This is in the olden days what we thought management was, right? And maybe it was in those days. Plan, implement, control. It was simple. Nowadays, we can no longer just say, that's only half of the picture, he says. We need to understand changes. We need to understand a new situation. Firstly, we need to make sense of it all. Because these days, changes, uh, pressures are so complex, complicated, with so many different influences at different levels of the organization, we often fail to make sense of it. The problem is, what management sometimes does, what, do our competition, what are the competition doing? Let's do the same. Right, does that sound familiar to some of you? Um, so, and that's not always the right answer. We need to make sense of things first. Then we need to form ideas. I, how did you say it? Ideation? Ideating. Okay, he says ideating. All right, I'll take it. Form ideas about what needs to be done. Then elaborate on it to have sufficient detail so we can then implement it in a performance cycle. Now, in program management, we need both those cycles. And the cycles, by the way, repeat themselves. You don't do this once. You do it a little bit, you consolidate. Then you look again at it, you start over again. So there is a period of consolidation because programs implement large changes. Changes are disruptive. So if your performance level is here, you start implementing a program without, without consolidation. You tend to slow down into a danger zone when management says, oh, this is not working. Look what we're doing to ourselves. Let's cut it. Stop it. He says, do it a little bit, consolidate, let the benefits take place, then do the next step, the next step, the next step. Eventually, you will end up at a high level of performance without having killed the whole initiative because of perceived um, non-value. Non